Today we are looking at a case from the early 19th century. So sit back as we go to England. John Thurtle was born on the 21st of December 1794 in the beautiful city of Norwich in the east of England. His father, Thomas Thurtle, was a wealthy merchant and a very well-respected and influential gentleman in the area. He was a councillor and also served for a period as the city mayor. Although John was educated in the best schools, he proved to be a poor student and much preferred to spend his time participating in and attending sports events, notably horse racing and bare knuckle boxing, both of which were usually accompanied by drinking and gambling. As his behaviour didn't improve, John's father decided that it would be best if his son finished his education and served in the Navy. So in May 1809, Thomas Thurtle purchased a commission and John travelled to the Kent town of Chatham, where he joined Company 99 of the Royal Navy and was assigned to the ship HMS Adamant. John may have been excited about the prospect of serving his king and country, and although some ships were deployed to places such as the Indian Ocean to fight against the French in the Battle of Grandport, HMS Adamant didn't see any active duty during this period and instead sailed to the Firth of Forth in Scotland, where it stayed in dock. In the summer of 1810, John was discharged from the HMS Adamant for misconduct. He did, however, manage to join another Navy ship, this time the HMS Bellona. He stayed with the Bellona for four years, being part of the crew that travelled to the small island of St Helena in the South Atlantic. But again, the ship spent much time in dock, mainly on the Isle of Wight. John resigned his Navy commission in June 1814 and proudly returned to Norwich. He told stories of how he had been in battles near San Sebastian in northern Spain, and although not true, the people who he told them to seemed suitably impressed with his bravery. John's father, Thomas, encouraged by his son's life in the Navy, decided to help him set up a business and along with a friend named John Giddens, he started to manufacture bombazine, which was a fabric used to make dresses and very popular in the early 19th century. At first, the two gentlemen proved to be shrewd businessmen and used Thomas Thurtle's influence and reputation to persuade local traders to extend them credit while their business was developing. John Thurtle, however, soon became distracted when he became friends with a boxer who had moved to Norwich from London. His new friend told him of places to visit where gentlemen could place bets on the outcome of horse racing and bare knuckle boxing, and this fascinated John. So while his partner John Giddens did his best to run the business, John Thurtle spent more time in London. The business started to suffer and they began to miss payments owed to their creditors. Fortunately, a company based in London agreed to buy a large amount of bombazine. This was a great relief, especially if the company became a regular customer. John Thurtle decided that he would personally visit the company and collect the payment. However, when he returned to Norwich, his face was cut and bruised and his clothes were dirty. When he was asked what had happened, he announced that he had been set upon and the money he had collected had been stolen. No one quite believed his story, least of all his creditors, who wasted no time in calling in their debts, which forced the business to become insolvent. This was a very embarrassing situation for John's father, but things only got worse when John's older brother, named Tom, was declared bankrupt due to his failed venture into farming. The brothers were now both undischarged bankrupts, so they left Norwich and made their way to London. In an attempt to try and make money, John followed different business opportunities, which he usually set up in his brother's name, but none really worked. In 1822, he came up with a plan to get them both discharged from bankruptcy. He thought he could exploit a loophole in the Insolvent Debtors Act of 1813. This meant that his brother Tom 
would be sent to prison for a short time after defaulting on a loan that was granted by John. However, John had not been very thorough when interpreting the act and his brother stayed in prison for over a year, only being released when John withdrew his complaint. On his release, Tom returned to Norwich. John was very good at finding new ways of trying to make money and he soon started a new venture by taking a lease at a tavern in the Haymarket area of the city. At the time, this area was often frequented by petty criminals and undesirables. In the basement of the tavern, there were some items of value, which even though they did not belong to John, he decided to sell, and with the proceeds, paid a deposit for a large amount of bombazine, which he was able to store in his newly acquired warehouse. He also took out an insurance policy on the warehouse and the goods inside. Then, having made some minor structural changes, making sure that no one could see inside from the streets, he sold off all the bombazine that he had previously obtained on credits. And on the 26th of January, 1823, the warehouse mysteriously caught fire. When local investigators examined the scene, they noticed that there was absolutely no trace of any bombazine. They became suspicious, as even after the fire, they were sure that they would have found some remnants of the goods inside. After the investigators filed their reports, the insurance company refused to pay the claim. John was incensed that they would not pay, so took legal advice on what to do. As the warehouse and the lease at the tavern had been taken out in his brother's name, posing as Tom, John took the insurance company to court for not paying the claim, and he won the case. Despite losing in court, the insurance company still refused to pay, and instead took out an indictment against him for conspiracy to defraud an insurance company. This was somewhat of an issue for John, as he no longer had much of the money he had made from selling the bombazine, due mainly to his frequent visits to the city's gambling houses. He had also accumulated many debts at his tavern, all of which remained unpaid. So facing a charge of conspiracy and worried that without any bail money, he would be arrested and sent to prison to await trial. He went into hiding at a pub called the Coach and Horses, which was nearby in Conduit Street. He thought that he had been unfairly treated and was feeling aggrieved with his situation. He convinced himself that he had been wronged by many people, and as he stayed out of sight whilst in hiding, this feeling began to fester. The person with whom he had the biggest grudge was a fellow gambler who worked as a solicitor named William Weir. John had accused him of cheating him out of £300 in a game of cards, which was a considerable amount of money in 1823, and John had no means to pay it. He also believed that his reputation as a gentleman had been ruined, and he blamed this solely on William Weir. John decided that he would have to do away with the gentleman who had so badly wronged him. So on the pretense that he thought that they should reconcile their differences, he invited William Weir to spend the weekend with him and some friends at a cottage owned by a fellow gambler named William Probert. The cottage was in the village of Radlett, which was about 20 miles outside the city. On the 24th of October, 1823, John hired a horse and a two-wheeled cart known as a gig and traveled to the cottage with William Weir. Just before they arrived, John stopped in a narrow lane near to the wagon and horses inn. And here he confronted William about how he had cheated him out of 300 pounds. He was still enraged about the events that led him to lose the card game and accumulate the debt. Suddenly, he took out a pistol and fired it at the defenceless gentleman. The bullets, however, only grazed his cheekbone and William managed to run off. John chased him and when William tripped over a branch, John finished him off with a knife and by hitting him with the muzzle of the pistol. John had thought that his friends William Probert and Joseph Hunt were travelling in a carriage just a few minutes behind, but unbeknown to him, they had not long left London. As aware of his plan to kill William Weir, the two gentlemen had spent hours discussing whether they should be party to such a grisly crime. 
John carefully placed a pistol and the knife in a nearby hedge and patiently waited for his friends to arrive. When they eventually turned up, they were greeted by John. It was cold and dark. So the three men took the body and put it into the pond in the garden of William Probert's cottage. They then discussed what they should do next. The following day, John returned to the hedge to retrieve the knife and pistol, only to discover that they were not there. Then that evening, the three men nervously transported the body to Elstree, which was three miles away, where they dumped it in the village pond. John was unaware that the pistol and knife had been handed to the local constable, who had already visited the place where the items were found and had observed blood on the road. When William Weir failed to turn up for work in London, he was reported missing. At the time, the country was policed largely by local constables and night watchmen. An investigation was launched, and when the authorities spoke to the friends of the missing gentleman, they were told they had arranged to spend the weekend with John Thurtle in Radlett. It soon became apparent that something untoward had happened to William Weir. The newspapers had been fascinated by the story and had dubbed the case the Elstree murder. It did not take long for the authorities to piece together what had happened on the night of the 24th of October, 1823. They traced the company that had hired John the horse and gig. The horse was grey and very distinctive. People who had been on the road that day confirmed that they had seen it and that it was being driven by a young man who was accompanied by a smartly dressed male of similar age. The local constables soon went to visit John Thurtle. They searched his room and found a pistol, identical to the one that had been discovered in the hedge in Radlett. It was later confirmed that they were sold as a pair. They also interviewed his friends, William Probert and Joseph Hunt. The two gentlemen had not been involved in the murder and William Probert keen to exonerate himself from suspicion, told the authorities everything that happened that fateful night. He was presumed innocent, and any charges the authorities thought they may place on him were dropped, and instead he became a prosecution witness. Joseph Hunt had admitted that he helped to move the body, and along with John Thurtle, he was arrested and taken into custody to await trial which began in January 1824 in the town of Hartford. John was charged with murder and Joseph Hunt was charged with being an accessory, which carried the same maximum sentence of death by hanging. The public seemed to talk about little else, so much so that it was thought it would be very difficult for the two accused gentlemen to receive a fair trial as in the eyes of both the press and the public, John Thurtle and Joseph Hunt were guilty. This trial was the last in England, which was conducted under the old 16th century principles, where the accused had to defend themselves and was unable to cross-examine any prosecution witnesses. All the evidence was heard, and then the accused had the opportunity to address the court. After all the witnesses were called, and the prosecution rested its case. John Thurtle made a long speech about how he was innocent of the crime and said that the person responsible was in fact William Probert. The jury were not influenced by his version of events and took just 20 minutes to find both gentlemen guilty. John Thurtle and Joseph Hunt were sentenced to death. Joseph, however, had his sentence commuted in recognition that he had helped the authorities with their investigation and instead was transported to a penal colony in Australia. On the 9th of January, John Thurtle was hanged. Before his execution, he confessed his guilt to a priest. Although William Probert had not been charged with any crime, he had become a well-known person following the trial. This meant that he found it difficult to find employment and was considered as someone to be avoided by the society ladies and gentlemen in 1820s London. Unable to support himself or his wife, he stole a horse, a crime for which he was arrested and at his subsequent trial, he was found guilty. 
and was hanged on the 20th of June, 1825. When Joseph Hunt was released, he stayed in Australia. He got married and became a respectable citizen and the father of two daughters. He died in 1861. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next Brief Case.